Hey, Life Group Leaders. I am uh, glad to be with you today. Uh, this is a video to overview our most recent training on October 16th, 2022. Either uh, if you weren't able to be there or if you would just like a little bit of a refresher on what we discussed. That's the purpose of this video. So naturally, we won't be able to do everything that we did at the training because there were some things that we did with, with other group leaders and some discussions and some things like that. So this would primarily just be informational, some things that I shared during the training so that you can uh, take some of the information and run with it. And then as always, we do encourage you guys, if at all possible, to be able to attend these trainings in person. Um, they're just something about being in a room full of other people who are doing the same thing, who are working the same type of ministry. It can just be a really big encouragement and a really big help. And so I, I encourage you to be there. I know that it's not possible for everybody for varying reasons, but um, thank you for your efforts in that. And thank you for that you're taking this time to watch this video. And so what I'll do is I'll start with just a few housekeeping items. So we'll start with the uh, with the boring stuff on the front end, and then we will we'll jump into the content today. So um, when I first came to Center Grove and had the chance to speak with all of the leaders, I did a uh, I did a brief devotional basically on the fact that in creation, what you see is you see God creating these structures that were capable of producing life. So he didn't put humans on the earth until he made the earth. And he made, of course, all of what makes up the earth, which was a structure that was capable of producing vegetation and sustaining animal life. And then, of course, sustaining God's image bearers, humans. And so one thing that I pointed out was the fact that there were structures that were in place that were capable of producing life. Now, it's God's spirit that still brings the life, but the structures were there to help facilitate the life. Another illustration that you've probably heard before, maybe from Dr. Quartz, is the illustration of the trellis and the vine. So the trellis helps is the structure where the vine grows. And so that's the, that is what we're trying to do within our life groups. And it's taking some time, and, uh, and it will take some time because... Um, each life group is unique and different, and you each have your own leadership strengths and things that you probably need to work on. And so uh, I want to respect those strengths and let you build on those while also giving you some help and some resources and some structure. And so on my end, there's some structures that we've implemented and we'll keep tweaking in order to help. And that's kind of what this housekeeping time is all about, is to tell you about some of the structures that are hopefully able to help your groups keep growing and producing life. One of those structures is we have a process for uh, identifying <clears throat> and training leaders and co-leaders. So one of the most dangerous things you can do in a church is to have no process for vetting and training leaders, especially leaders of small groups. So we want, I have a goal to where every single life group would have a, a co-leader or apprentice leader. And there's a process to actually help you get there if you don't have a co-leader or apprentice leader. And if you have somebody within your group or a friend that you know within the church who asks about leading a life group, then you can send them to me and I can walk them through the process. And so I'll send you guys a document on what we call our serving manual where it has this process laid out. What are the prerequisites to be a group leader and what does it take? And then we can, just so that you can know for your information. Um, another thing in regards to structures is not only do I prayerfully hope that every group will at some point have a co-leader or apprentice leader, but there are some other things that we would like to launch that we think will help the culture of discipleship at our church. So one of those things that we are uh, hoping to build, but we, we, got, we don't want to put the car before the horse, is we would like to build a coaching structure where each life group has a coach that you actually can go to for resources and for help. I am always available for life group leaders and always ready to point you guys in the right direction to share resources. But if we want to multiply groups and have a scalable opportunity for more groups to launch in our church, then we want to have coaches who can help invest in life groups so that more life groups can launch and be healthy. And why is this so important? Well, on a very, very practical level, this is so important because we have a number of new families who are joining our church. Since January, about 90% or so of our first time guests have been families with kids in the home still. And those people don't automatically just find life groups. Oftentimes, starting new life groups is the best way to get them connected in community. So we are desperately praying for more leaders to be 
to rise up and to launch new groups. So we have a lot of opportunities for that. So if you have leadership potential within your life group, please let me know. I will help you and help them get ready for leadership, whether it be within your group or if they choose to multiply and start a new group. And remember, for life group leaders, we're looking for people who are fat, faithful, available, and teachable. Faithful, available, and teachable. We're not looking for people who have all of the skills. We're not looking for people who are smooth talkers. We're not looking for people who act like they have all the answers. Uh, we are looking for people who have been faithful, they've been consistent, who are available, who are ready to help and ready to serve, and who are teachable, who, are, who aren't, haven't figured everything out, uh, but are willing to learn and grow. So those are the people who are, make up the best leaders. Um, and that's one thing we're working on is a coaching structure and a, uh, so that we can launch more life groups. And then the coaching structure is, is really tied intimately to the idea of developing leaders and co-leaders. And then lastly, another thing that I'm really excited about that I shared in other videos, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, is uh, we're launching an initiative called Discipleship Mentoring Groups. Okay, This is something that is going to be a huge deal in the life of our church, and it's something that I want life group leaders to have the first chance to participate in if you want. I shared this at our August training, and I sent a video about it afterwards. But if you have questions about our discipleship mentoring groups, please let me know. I'd be glad to tell you more. Those are starting, and um, we have a key event for those in November, and they're going to actually be commissioned and launched in January. So um, more on that in the future. I don't have time to discuss it in this video, but please let me know if you have questions about our discipleship mentoring groups and intensive discipleship initiative we're starting soon. Lastly, I say this every time, I'm going to be a broken record. Um, please continue to be faithful in submitting attendance. We are continually cleaning up our database. We firmly believe in, in um, biblical church membership, which means we know where our people are. We're helping them. We're coming alongside them. We're shepherding them. And the way that we actually, uh, a structure that's capable of helping that actually flourish is our database being up to date and us knowing where people are and if they're attending life groups faithfully. So please continue to do that and let us know when you have guests come to your groups because we, we like to track all that so that we can be faithful with church membership and with shepherding people. Thank you so much. Okay, that's enough for the housekeeping time. Now, uh, seven and a half minutes in, uh, let me give you, um, let, let me share with you something that I want you to get tired of hearing at some point because it's that important. And it is the three aims that we have for our life groups. Those three aims, hopefully you know them by now, they are found in your field guide. If you haven't gotten one of these and you haven't had the chance to read through this, please do that ASAP. I have plenty of copies. This is for you. We're going to keep trying to make this resource better, but we have this field guide for your, uh, for your sake so that you can uh, lead to the best of your ability. But the three aims that make up a healthy life group are this, gospel-centeredness, community, and mission. Gospel centeredness is the ability to actually think and speak the gospel fluently, right? Just like a language. And so that's how, what, what are the discussions like within our life group? Are we seeing Jesus in the scriptures? Are we avoiding works righteousness and legalism and focusing our sight on Jesus? Are we learning to see our lives through the lens of the gospel? That's gospel centeredness, and we have more details on that in the field guide. The next measure of health within our life groups is community. Community is a life-sharing, burden-bearing, and bread-breaking gathering of people. So you know you're doing community well when you're doing those three things. You're sharing life together. You're doing things together inside and outside the group. You're bearing burdens together, whether it's, whether it be helping somebody move, helping somebody through an emotionally difficult time, helping somebody with financial difficulty, or you're providing an environment where vulnerability happens, where people can confess sin. And then thirdly, you are breaking bread together. Breaking bread together is eating together, being thankful to the Lord, and, and spending time together over a meal. So... Uh, that's what community is. So we've got gospel-centeredness as a measure of success, the ability to think and speak the gospel. We have community as a measure of success, which is a life-sharing, burden-bearing, bread-breaking gathering of people. And then our third measure of success, which we're going to spend time talking about today, is a group that is focused on a mission. You have a mission. And living life on mission, we're defining it as basically being people who create and cultivate relationships with our neighbors, or within our networks that will lead to gospel sharing opportunities. So essentially living life on mission is being cultivators of your life and cultivators of relationships that will lead to gospel sharing and gospel serving. 
And that's what we're talking about this evening. And there's a couple specific ways that we do that within our life groups. And we're going to start touching on that tonight. And so before we do that, let me just, uh, let me just share an illustration with you that I, that I uh, shared at the training on Sunday night. And that illustration you could call, I'm calling this brief session, um, the curse of knowledge and the gift of story, the curse of knowledge and the gift of story. So there's this uh, science experiment you could do if you, if you so chose where if you tried to grow a pumpkin within a, within a jar, the pumpkin would grow inside the jar and take the shape of the jar, but it would not break out of it. So it would grow in the shape of whatever it was, whatever it was enclosed into, but it would not break out of it. And what this symbolizes and illustrates is the fact that sometimes we have something called the curse of knowledge, where based on our prior experiences in church or life group or life in general, we have this way of doing things and it kind of keeps us in this jar and we don't ever think outside of it in order to be even more effective. And we get basically caught in these rhythms of just doing the same thing over and over again. And when we do the same thing over and over again, we oftentimes will see the same results that we're getting. And so we want to we want to break out of the jar, uh, so to speak. And and all of us get in these ruts. So this is not to shame you at all. This all of us get in these ruts where we just kind of get going through the motions, and we don't really stop and ask: Is what I'm doing effective? Is what I'm doing working? And one of the ways that you can kind of help break out of this jar that you often are enclosed in due to a due to the curse of knowledge, knowing a certain way of doing things and not thinking outside the box, is to one of the ways to break out of this mindset is to see yourself as a part of God's story. Because when we read the Bible, sometimes we will read it as these isolated theological truths, and we forget to read it as a story that God is inviting us into, right? So if you just know some things about God, like he's all-powerful and he's good and he's loving, those things are great, and you need to know those things. But sometimes that can make you forget that God has a story that he's writing in the scriptures, and it's not about you, but it's for you, and it's an invitation to live life understanding the story that God is writing in history. Uh, he's still writing today, and the Bible helps us do that. And so one of, the greatest, uh, one, one of the greatest and most popular texts that actually help us see our place in God's story comes out of Jeremiah chapter 29. Most of us know Jeremiah 29, 11. Uh, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, you know, go, so on and so forth. We know that verse, and it's very encouraging to all of us. But sometimes uh, we don't read the surrounding context, and the surrounding context is really, really beautiful. And so if you have your, if you have your Bibles or if you have your phone, what I would encourage you to do, pause this video right now, read Jeremiah 29, verses 4 through 11, and uh, just take some observations. Write some things down that you see. And then in a few minutes, once you do that, click play again, and I'll make a few observations that, uh, that are really important for us to point out. Pause the video. All right, so I trust you're back and ready to go. And um, I know that some of you uh, are probably listening to this in the car, so you probably didn't do that, but uh, you're forgiven and I love you, and you can go back and do this uh, and read that text later. But there's a few observations that I want to make that help us remember that we are part of God's story if you read this passage. So if you see here, the context of this passage is really the, the people of Israel had been faithless to God, frankly. And because of their faithlessness, God exiled, exiled them out of the land that he gave them, and he sent them off to a foreign place. And there are so many important things uh, going on here that we don't have time to go into. But essentially, the story of the Bible is a story of humans being exiled out of God's presence due to our failure to trust him. And that's, it started in the garden. Remember, God placed Adam and Eve in a garden, and they decided to do what was right in their own eyes. And then they had to leave God's presence because they thought that they could do God, they could be God better than God could be God. All right? And Israel throughout their history, would do the same thing. And so God would have to essentially let them face the consequences of their decisions so that they would come back to him. And so that's what God does. And he sends them to uh, a foreign, uh, to Babylon to be in exile. All right. And then the New Testament picks up on this theme. And the New Testament picks up on this theme 
And it reminds us that God, um, in, in Jesus, we are, of course, made new, we are loved, we are adopted, and now God's presence actually resides in us, and we are God's, uh, we are God's temple. That's what it means to be his temple, is to have his presence with you. But still, there's this feeling, because the world isn't made new yet, there's this feeling that we are still exiles in some way. That we still are longing for God to come back and make all things new, for us to be placed back in the garden, so to speak, where God's presence is in everything, and we see it everywhere. And so the first observation I want to make here that helps us see ourselves in God's story, and that you see here in Jeremiah 29, is the fact that we are exiles. We are exiles living in a foreign land, waiting for God to make this land new. That's what we are. And if you've had a bad day, if you've experienced difficulty in your life, if you've experienced a hard time, you know what it feels like to be in exile, to feel like there's something off. I'm outside of God's presence, and if God's presence was here, things would be made right. Well, that's what we are. We're exiles. And um, the cool thing is, though, even as exiles, we actually get to invite God's presence to come into the place that we have been exiled, and God will show up, and other people will be invited into this new identity, where we're exiles because this world really doesn't fit with our new identity and, our, and the fact that we're a new creation because the world is broken and it will need to be made new. And so we feel that deep within us, that we are exiles and this world is not how it ought to be. And that's how you remember you're part of God's story. When you're at work and you're feeling left out a little bit because people just talk differently than you and you might not be invited to the party or whatever, or, you're, uh, or you look back on other times in your life where just because of your faith, it just, you know, you couldn't, enter in that conversation or you couldn't say that thing or you couldn't do that thing that a lot of other people you knew were doing. That just points back to the fact that uh, we're exiles waiting on God to make things new. All right. But as exiles, we invite people into this hope where they can look, look ahead and pray and hope to see God make all things new. So that's one way you kind of break out of the jar. You remember, you know, I'm an exile. This world is not my home. And we see that clearly in the text, especially in verse 4. The letter was written to people who were exiled. And so that's what we see in our own lives. Secondly, if you look at verses 5 and 6, and you can see this insinuated throughout this text, we are cultivators. We are cultivators. So a, a problem within... Um, American Christianity over the years has been, instead of being cultivators of the communities we live in, sometimes we try to escape where we are and try to just keep our heads down until Jesus returns. But that is not what God calls the people called the people of Israel to do, and it's not what he calls us to do. He actually calls us to be cultivators, meaning we take whatever context we're in, and we try to make and do good things in the name of Jesus because of this. Specifically, I would say God has placed you in a social context where he wants you to be a cultivator of relationships. The text says that, the, that God tells the people through Jeremiah to seek the welfare of the city, to cultivate, to build houses, to plant plants, to marry and give their daughters into marriage and to do these things and to cultivate a good place. So we should, uh, we should be cultivators. And that, what that comes down to is serving our neighbors, trying to build relationships with them, trying to go the extra mile to ask people's names, to meet them, to ask them questions. And that helps us see ourselves in God's story. If you go to work or you go to the gym or you go to whatever, wherever you go throughout your day and you think, you know what, maybe God has a relationship he wants me to cultivate. That, that helps you break out of the jar of keeping your head down, doing the same thing and just kind of getting through your day. We're cultivators. And the last observation from the text that I want you to see here that helps us rem remember we're in God's story is uh, we are seekers. We're seekers. We seek the welfare of the place we're in. We seek God and we seek other people. We seek the welfare of the city that we're in. We seek God and we seek other people. And when you remember that you're in exile with the hope of a new creation, you're a cultivator placed in your context for a purpose, and then you're a seeker, seeking God and others as you live your life, that can help you see people differently and see your life differently and to see yourself as a part of God's story. And we want people within our life groups to embrace those identities and to actually see themselves as a part of God's story. So now the question is, how do we do this as life group leaders? What are some practical ways to do this? Because that's theoretical, that's, a, that's ideal, but what do we, how do we take this and make it real? 
And you guys actually know the answer to this. And I'm going to just tell you some things that you probably, that you already know. But most of the time, we don't need to learn new things. We just need to be reminded of old things and then make some plans to do them. So if you have a copy of your field guide, we have updated this a little bit to represent what I'm about to say. But basically, there's three ways life groups can play this role, play the, these three roles as a cultivator, a seeker, and an exile. There's three things you can do as a life group. You can regularly serve local partners. You can seek to multiply your group. And you can encourage personal gospel sharing within your group. You can serve local partners. You can seek to multiply. And you can personally share the gospel with people in your life and encourage others in your life group to do this. So I'm going to actually uh, send out, if you were at the training, you got this. I'm going to send out a basically a little table that will help you think through these things and actually how to do them in greater measure. But one thing that you will, that you missed if you weren't at the training is when it comes to personal gospel sharing, Jackson, our ministry resident, he has been tasked to help us just basically pour some gasoline on this passion to share the gospel that's, that we have found is within our church. And he is working on resources and help and working on people to help stoke this flame within our church. And so what Jackson is doing is he's looking for what, two types of people that we can document and track. And he's looking, the two types of people he's looking for are people of peace and people of passion. People of peace are non-believers who are open to conversations. People of passion are believers who have a passion for evangelism. And Jackson is trying to look for those people. And so if you have a person of passion within your life group who naturally and relationally shares their faith, and they just kind of do so out of the overflow of their life, and it just comes naturally to them, and they're really passionate about it, or if it's somebody who doesn't know how to do it yet, but they're passionate about the idea of evangelism, then make sure you reach out to myself or Jackson, and he's got some tools that he's created and he's fixing and tweaking, I should say, that is going to help people be faithful shares of their faith. So we have some tools you can implement within your life group that will help with personal gospel sharing. And there's actually going to be a right now media study that you guys can do as a group that will help encourage this. We've got some other resources and it's just something that you want to regularly encourage within your group. At very least, just take a day, take a group time. And write down all the names of people you know who are close to the folks in your group but far from God and just pray for those people. That's step one. That's what you can do. So you want to encourage gospel sharing within your group to live out these identity markers. Uh, you also want to seek to be a group that multiplies or helps a group start. So there's multiple ways you can do this. This is why co-leaders and apprentice leaders are so important. But we are we are in a process where we're trying to launch some more groups. And if you have folks that you want to help send out to start these groups and be a part of a core team or people who are fat, faithful, available, and teachable who could actually lead these groups, please come talk to me. I'm, I can help you get them ready and launch them out. But we, we are in a cool season in the life of our church where we desperately want to launch some more groups and create some more environments for people to connect. Uh, but then lastly, as a life group, we encourage you to regularly serve a local partner. And we may try to do a couple big serving days in the spring and in, and maybe the next fall. I don't have that completely planned out yet. And so in the meantime, I would encourage you, if you look at the back of your field guide here, remember a lot of things are in here that answer some of the questions you might have. If you look in the back of your field guide, you'll see a list of our local partners on page 48 and 49. And you can ask me which one of these local partners would be a good fit for your group. And I can help get you in touch with those partners so that you can actually set up some time to serve some people. So you see how that will help you cultivate your city by coming alongside these local partners. But then you also want to encourage personal gospel sharing, which that just simply involves people that are in your neighborhood or in your network, your place of work or your place of play. And you want to encourage your group members to actually be sharing their faith and living on mission. And we want to help with that. So the three, the, basically the action steps that we have coming off of this training is uh, pretty simple. Uh, we, want to, we want you to target a partner and a date to serve. Uh, probably 
it could be before the end of this year or it could be at the beginning of next year. We also want you to find a way to encourage more personal gospel sharing within your groups, which that, this could simply be you just start praying for lost people in your group. That could be it. But then thirdly, we want some help uh, and we want your participation in helping us seek to multiply some of our groups. Some of you might not have a leader that's ready to multiply, but you might have people in your group who could serve great on a core team. I might come and ask you guys, do you have anybody who could help us start a group on Wednesday nights at 6.30 at the church? And we might start trying to gather from some of your groups to start a core and to start a new group because new groups are easier to connect in for new people. That's really the heart behind it. So that's really what we're after. And we're going to give you a sheet to help actually think through this in more detail. But essentially what we covered at this at this last training was the idea of living life on mission to see ourselves as cultivators, as exiles, and as seekers, and to break out of the curse of knowledge, the pumpkin jar, and to see ourselves as a part of God's story and actually push this forward within our life groups, within our spheres of influence. So in closing, uh, I want to say that I'm honored to serve with you. I'm so grateful for your ministries and for your groups. And I'm so grateful for your faithful service. Thank you for bearing with me as I uh, will regularly and annoyingly bother you about attendance and about administrative details. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep doing that just so that we can be faithful with that. You'll hear from Britt in an email or text. Thank you for your participation, participation in these trainings. And uh, for those of you participating in our DMG process, thank you for doing that as well. We love you guys. I hope you have a great day. Please contact me if you have any questions at all.